the blessing of business. Some of, some of you have been out sick and dealing with medical issues, but you're here today. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Yes. Matthew 26, starting with verse 1, here's what it says. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. With this serving as the scriptural premise of our sermonic effort today, I want to talk about have you arrested Jesus or has he arrested you? Yes, sir. Have you arrested Jesus or has he arrested you? Amen, amen. Pray with me if you please. On Palm Sunday as we approach Holy Week and the celebration around the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. We oftentimes think about the triumphal entry of Jesus. We think of him riding into Jerusalem on a donkey in spectacular fashion with people as we were waving palm branches and joyfully exclaiming, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. We applaud and we venerate our king's victorious entry into Jerusalem. And we do so realizing that in just a few days, those joyous shouts of praise would become venomous shouts of persecution as they would move from Hosanna to crucify him. And their call to crucify him was not a call that just cropped up overnight. But there had been for a long time an effort to stall Jesus, to stop Jesus, and to silence him in his tracks. The call to crucify him was only the culmination of what had been building for a few years. Listen, church, to the word of God and think on how intense the opposition to Jesus must have been even before his crucifixion. As early as Matthew chapter 12, as early as Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, it says, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Matthew 22, 15, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. Mark eleven eighteen, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. Mark 14, 55, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death but they did not find any. 
Luke 6, 11, but they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Luke 19, 47, every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 19, Jesus said to the Jews, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? In John eleven fifty three. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. And in John eight thirty seven, Jesus says to the Pharisees, I know. You are Abraham's descendants. Yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. That's what he said. He said, because you have no room for my word. And that's something I wonder about today, church. I wonder if there's any room for the Lord's word in his church. I wonder if there's any room for his word in your heart. And I wonder if there's any room for his word in your life. It's not enough that there was no room in the end for him at birth. But even after his resurrection, there are so many that still have no room for his word. I tell you that the call to crucify him was not a call that just cropped up overnight. Because you see, besides the scripture I just read in your hearing to highlight the intensity of opposition towards Jesus, there are yet a few more scriptures that distinguish themselves further from what I've already read. Matthew 21, 46 says in part, they looked for a way to arrest him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark 14, 1 says in part, and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus. And our text today says the same thing in verse 4. And they schemed to arrest Jesus. My God. And that's what I want to focus your attention on in here today, church. We know the crucifixion is coming. We know the ridicule is coming. We know the mocking and spitting and gambling of his clothes is coming. And we know that the crown of thorns is coming. But for the purposes of this Palm Sunday, I'd like to have you to stop short of the crucifixion and stop short of Calvary's cross that you might think on his arrest. Because I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not so sure that we, I'm not so sure that you and me always wind up on the right side of the arrest. What you talking about, preacher? I mean that quite clearly. Jesus came into the world to arrest you. But I wonder if it is you who have arrested him. I wish I had somebody praying with me. Jesus came into the world to command you. But I wonder if it's you who tries to command him. Jesus came into the world to apprehend you. But I wonder if it's you who tries to apprehend him. Jesus came into the world to lead you. But I wonder if it's you who tries to lead him. Thus we have as the subject of today's message, have you arrested Jesus? Or has he arrested you? Are you responsible for slowing him down? 
rather than allowing him to slow you down? Are you responsible for doing more to get in his way rather than allowing him to get in your way? Are you the one detaining and restricting Jesus rather than allowing Jesus to detain and restrict you? The question for your consideration, the question on the table, the question that I present to you today is have you arrested Jesus? Or has he arrested you? Yeah, because you see, church, in order for Jesus to give up his life for you, he had to first, somebody say first, he had to first allow himself to be arrested. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in order for him to give up his life for you, he had to first allow himself to be arrested by the authorities and he had to allow them to take him in to custody. Yeah, and, and what's remarkable about this church, what's remarkable about this thing with Jesus is that to a far lesser degree, if we believe him and love him and follow him, we ought to be willing to do the same thing for him that he for us. I wish I had somebody in here. I said in order for Jesus to give up his life for you, he had to first allow himself to be arrested by the authorities and he had to allow them to take him into custody. And the same spiritual, reciprocal gesture is required and expected of you if you claim to be his disciple. Come on in here, Holy Ghost. In order for you to give up your life for him, you have to first allow yourself to be arrested by his authority. And then you have to allow him to take you into custody. Let me let me say that again. Let me say that again. I said, in order for you to give up your life for him, in order for you to give up your life for him, in order for you to give up your life for him, you have to first allow yourself to be arrested by his authority and then you have to allow him to take you into custody. I wish I had just a little bit of help in here today because you know you know one thing about Jesus church is that there is no record of him ever resisting his arrest. Amen. Mm -hmm. There, 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 there. I said there is no record of him ever resisting his arrest. Amen. He resisted the temptations of the devil, yeah. but he did not resist his arrest. In fact, Bible readers know that when Peter drew his sword and cut off the man's ear, it was Jesus who told Peter to stop and to put his sword away. I heard one preacher say that it was as if Jesus said, look, man, look, Peter, if faith comes by hearing, then you can't be cutting off people's ears with all the preaching you're going to be doing. Uh, he put the man's ear back on, and they kept it moving. You see, Jesus, Jesus had working in the background of his mind all the time what he said in John 10, 17, 18. Therefore, doth my father love me? Because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but, 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 praise his name for but, but I lay it down of myself. Lord have mercy. So whereas he may have resisted the temptation of the devil, he never resisted his arrest. But you see, this is where me and you get tripped up sometimes. Because rather than resisting the devil, we roll with him. And rather than rolling with Jesus, we resist him. Yeah, let me say that again. I said, rather than resisting the devil, we roll with him. And rather than rolling with Jesus, 
we resist him. Tell somebody, don't do that. In this season of resurrection, we focus on and celebrate what Jesus gave up for us on Calvary's cross. And we should always celebrate the cross. But if you think this faith journey is only about what Jesus gave up for you, then you have been operating under a great misnomer and misunderstanding. Because our faith is not just about what Jesus gave up for you, but it's also about what you are willing to give up for him. Are y'all praying with me? I said it's also about what you are willing to give up for him. You don't believe me? Why do you think Peter told Jesus in Mark 10, 28, we left everything to follow you? Why do you think Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified? And why would Paul also say regarding the cause for Christ, I die daily? And why would Jesus himself say in Mark 16, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Ah, hallelujah to his holy name. Why was all of this said? Why was all of this announced, pronounced, and declared? Because the only way, I hope you are, I hope you're awake and listening, because the only way for you to truly and totally appreciate the level of sacrifice that he made for you is through the sacrifices that you are willing to make for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's through the sacrifices that you are willing to make for him. And the first order of business when it comes to sacrifice is you. When it's time for you to sacrifice for him, and make no mistake about it, child of God, make no mistake about it, church, it's always time for you to sacrifice for him. Your sacrifice is not to start small and then become big, but rather your sacrifice is to start big, it's supposed to stay big, and it's supposed to end big, because you are the sacrifice, you are the submission, you are the debt owed to Jesus based on the divine sacrifice that he made for you. Uh, help me in here. Tell somebody you owe Jesus. Come on, Facebook, put that in the chat. You owe Jesus. But of course, the problem is that we have a lot of people in the church resisting the Lord's arrest. Uh -huh. Don't look at me like that. I said we got a lot of people in the church resisting the Lord's arrest. Lord, you know my heart. No. You're resisting his arrest. I know I should have tied out of what the Lord has blessed me with. But I need to use it for something else. No. You're resisting his arrest. They didn't speak to me. So I'm not going to speak to them. No. You're resisting his arrest. I was going out to Bible study, but I'm tired. No, you're resisting his arrest. I should call and check on them, but they didn't call and check on me. No, you are resisting his arrest. I know I should get over it, but I'm still mad. No, you're resisting his arrest. And if there's anybody's arrest, you should submit to, it is the arrest of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you ought to submit to his arrest because you understand the Lord has not completely arrested you because you are resisting his arrest. You are resisting his word. You are resisting his call. You are resisting his will. You are resisting his direction. 
You are resisting his voice. You ain't got to say nothing. I know I'm preaching. You are resisting his pull. You are resisting his authority. You are resisting his command. You are resisting his way. You are resisting his dominion. You are resisting his power. You are resisting his sovereignty. You are resisting his supremacy. Yet you want to continue to receive, 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 even though you resist, resist, resist. You want to resist his lead, but receive his blessings. You want to resist his influence, but receive his protection. You want to resist his spirit, but receive his provision. And the reality of it all is this. If we will put as much time in on surrendering to him as we do on resisting him, and if we would do more praying to God and less praying with God, then we might have more peace, more power, more might, more strength, more productivity, more impact, more love, more light. More joy, more happiness, more missionaries, more willing workers, more servants, more prosperity, and more of the Lord's presence in our lives. But because we so often and so regularly resist his arrest, we get tripped up on the question, have you arrested Jesus or has he arrested you? Uh, in verse 2, Jesus says, as you know, the Passover is two days away. Yeah. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Uh-huh. That's what it says. My question to you, church, is if the Son of God, if the Son of Man was handed over for you, yeah. then what are you willing to to hand over for him. That makes sense, doesn't it? I'm out the way, church. Happy Palm Sunday to you. I just stopped by to tell somebody to take the handcuffs off Jesus. Take the handcuffs off the Savior. Take the handcuffs off the Lord. And let him have his way. Yeah. Yeah, let's take the shackles off Jesus. Yeah. Take the shackles off the Savior. Uh-huh. Take the shackles off the Lord. And let him yeah. have his way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
his enemies, but we ought to act more like we are his saved, we are his redeemed, we are his children, his disciples, his followers. We are to look more and more every day like him. We are to imitate him. We are to emulate him. We are to allow him in that he might transform and change our lives. But you have to first allow yourself to be arrested by him. You need to be taken into his custody. Yes, sir. If you are going to give up yourself for him. Yes, sir. He did it for you. Amen. To a far lesser degree, he expects us to do it for him. Oh yeah, he ain't expecting us to be up on the cross. Yes, Literally nailed to a tree. Uh -huh. But he does expect us to handle our test, trials, and tribulations well. Yeah. He does expect us to endure yeah. hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Stop complaining about every little thing going on in your life. Stop whining so much about what's off and wrong in your life and start to understand that you ought to have joy, 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 you ought to count it all joy when you find yourself in diverse temptations and, and testing and trying on every hand because you know that the testing of your faith builds perseverance yes. and stamina and testimony and witness and strength and puts new songs in your heart. You can't have no testimony without a test. Amen. And you can't have no crown without the cross. Said it last week in Bible study. Everybody wants to have Jesus as their Christ. Yes, but they struggle and have a harder time allowing Jesus to be their Lord. Yes, but we have to learn in these last and evil days how to acquiesce. We have to learn how to submit. We have to learn how to surrender. We have to learn how to humble ourselves and to surrender all and to give all of ourselves, our very being, to the one who bought us at a price and the price was blood. Yes, For you are not your own, but you've been bought at a price. Yes, Purchased with the currency of blood, yes, the saving blood, of Jesus Christ, that never ending power in that blood. We thank God that that blood never loses its power. Anybody glad that that blood doesn't lose its power today? And it can reach down to the gutter and bring up to the other. That's where he found me. He found me down there. His blood ran and dripped and found me down there. But oh, thank God for the blood of Jesus that knows how to lift, that knows how to raise how to restore, that knows how to redeem, how to rejuvenate, how to resuscitate, how to revive, how to redirect and turn a dying soul's direction around. Somebody ought to be glad today for the blood of Jesus Christ. And you ought to be in a hurry today. You ought to be more encouraged today to give yourself fully to him that he might arrest you and bring so much more peace, joy, and power into your life. Oh, yeah. The doors of the church are open today. Oh, yeah. There might be somebody here who does not know Jesus in the pardon of their sins. Yeah. We invite you at this time, at this hour, to come forward, to submit, to come forward, to surrender, yeah. to come forward, to give your life fully to him. Perhaps you've already given your life to him, but from right where you are, you need to commit to doing better. From right where you are, you need to commit to being more for him. From right where you are, you ought to commit to making more room in his life, in your life, for him. Word of God said, Jesus said, y'all ain't got no room for my word. That's why you want to kill me. 
And in essence, if you don't have room for his word, you are in effect killing him. That's why it's so important to make room for his word, to make room to be here early Sunday morning or late Wednesday evening that you might make more room for his word in your life. It's only to your benefit, it's only to your advantage that you would do so and keep him first in all of your efforts and in all that you do. God bless you, Facebook. We're going to go off with the doors of the church are now open.